Hi guys and welcome to the Ref6 Weekly. Uh, today we've got a special guest on the, uh, on today's podcast, which Hassan's going to talk to you about. Yeah, so this this week we've got an ex Premier League uh, player, Dean Hammond. He used to play for Brighton Hove Albion. He played at Southampton, uh, Colchester, and Leicester. Um, he was captain at, at Brighton and Southampton at some points too, and actually at Colchester. So um, he's played in League One, Championship, Premier League. Um, and was actually at Leicester in the squad the year that they won the Premier League, which is uh, a fascinating, uh, it must have been a, an amazing place to be around. Um, we sit here, sit down and chat to him about his opinion about referees, what uh, us as grassroots referees and, and as any level referees can do to, you know, build rapport with players. Um, and it's a real, it's probably my favourite one, John, is, is in terms of specials that we've done, this is, this is a yeah, good yeah. One. yeah, yeah. This is this is the best one we've done, I think. Yeah. Um, there is definitely one swear word that Dean uses in the in this uh, in this uh, interview. So if you are listening with kids uh, and you you are opposed to those language, maybe maybe this is one to pause and, and listen to on a run or something like that. But uh, yeah, great great uh, chat with Dean, and it's about to start now. Hi Dean, welcome to the Ref Six Weekly Podcast. Thanks for joining us. How's how's everything going? How's lockdown been for you? Uh, it's been okay. It's uh, the homeschooling was a bit of a challenge, I must admit. Uh, I've got three children, uh, so that was interesting. Uh, but it's been okay, mate. I mean, it, everyone's healthy and safe, so uh, that's a blessing. But yeah, you, uh, it's a bit samey, but we'll, yeah. we'll get on with it. And uh, there's some light at the end of the tunnel, which is there nice. is, and and and. Football, football, hopefully back at grassroots level fairly soon, which which we're all looking forward to. But um, Dean, what we want to chat to you about today, we, our audience is predominantly grassroots referees. So um, we gave an intro briefly about your career. You you played at Brighton, uh, Southampton, Leicester, Colchester, um, through through the different leagues, right? League One, Championship, Premier League. Um, and, and you were a captain at three of those clubs uh, at three of those clubs at some point in time. So we're really keen to understand from a player's perspective a few things, a few myths, and, and maybe some learnings that you can give us. So the major, the first question that we'd like to ask is: with every year, there seems to be new law changes that come about. So how do players um, keep up to date with what's what's new? Was it was it something I'm assuming you guys didn't read the laws of the game book? Like, how did you keep abreast of of changes every year during the summer? Well, it's, it's an interesting one. So obviously the rules would change and adapt uh, at all different spells. But at the start of every season, you would have a referee that would come into the football club, mm -hmm. um, a dedicated referee that's going to potentially be uh, refereeing at, at that level. Um, yeah. And they would come in and discuss the new laws and what they actually meant. Um, obviously, as you went higher up and at the bigger clubs, you are, there was more detail to it. Uh, for example, when I was at Leicester uh, in the Premier League, uh, the the man, uh, sorry, the referee would come in and do a demonstration. So it'd all be on uh, 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 TV, touchscreen. It would be a meeting. Uh, you'd have your interaction. They would explain the new rules. You would give your opinion on the rules. Uh, and then you would try to understand what it exactly meant. Mm -hmm. So then you could take that into, into the season. Um, the referee would uh, give reasons why the new rules were coming in, uh, which helped. Not that the players always agreed with it or necessarily always understood it, um, mm -hmm. but it was a good conversation. So it gave you awareness of what um, potentially what it was going to be like uh, in the upcoming season and what the changes um, had been. So you were well informed. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, then the coaches, the manager um, would have a more detailed meeting with the referee and a more personalised one to get the the real, real detail to then, again, be able to explain to the players if there was a misinterpretation. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you were fully aware what the changes were and that came from someone coming into the football club uh, and speaking to you about it. Brilliant. I guess that would inform potential tactics as well. I know, like recently, with the goal kick being allowed to be played in the box, that kind of changes the way teams play now, all of a sudden quick from the back and stuff. So... Really important to figure figure how those changes could actually impact uh, tactics too. I assume. Um, brilliant. 
I guess you you haven't played in a VI, VAR uh, world of football. What is your kind of personal view on VAR? Do you think it's a good thing? Uh, do you think it's yeah? Intrigued to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, so obviously I've not played in the game, but I'm I'm, I'm involved in the media again. I do a lot of work for Southampton and Leicester and uh, a few other uh, radio stations and TV stations, so I'm fully aware of it and discuss it quite a lot. Um, I'm on the fence, if I'm honest. Uh, if I'm totally honest, I think there's some huge value in it. I think it could it could benefit the game, but also there's some downsides to it at the moment. Uh, personally, I think you know it slows the game down a bit. It, it prevents the flow. Uh, and one thing that I personally don't like, I think it takes a lot of responsibility away from the referee. Uh, yeah. And I don't like that myself. I don't think from an outsider's point of view and from watching the games, I don't think the referees look comfortable with it. Uh, mm-hmm. I think they uh, they find it very, very difficult because they try to get every decision perfect and they can't because they're human beings and there's going to be error. Um, I think within football and the excitement of football, we all moan about it, but we like the human error to it as well. It makes it exciting. Um, so, look, I think there's there's a there's a place for it in the game. I really do think there is. It needs to be adapted. I think the responsibility needs to go back to the referee. What I would like is, you know, the referee, if the referee makes a decision, a big decision, not every foul, or th- mm-hmm. but big decisions, a sending off, a goal, a penalty, not a goal, that if someone... Uh, in the studio or someone else has had a different view of it, has seen it from a different angle, they can speak to the referee and go, look, you may just want to have another look at this. Yeah. Then they get a certain amount of time to go and look at the screen. I think there should be a time limit on it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people have argued against that, saying when it puts pressure on the referee. But the, there's pressure on the referee anyway. He has to make yeah. a split decision decision. So if he gets a minute to make a decision, that's that's like an eternity to him. So maybe you get he gets a minute from when he's looking at the screen, he sees it in three different angles, he gets one minute and he can change his opinion. But I would like to see the referees back in full control of the football match. It's not someone who's miles away, who sees it at different angles, where the line's straight, they're not, the line's not straight. Uh, what part of the body is offside is not offside. I think it's just way too confusing, but I do believe there's a place for it in modern football. No, that's that's class insight. Thank you very much for that. Um, in terms of when you went up the league, obviously VAR is a very elite thing with the Prem and the um, like uh, the UEFA. Um, but when you were going up the leagues, did you find that the style of referee ever changed, or was there a big difference between, say, League One and the Prem in the referees, or are they all very similar going all the way through? It's a good question, actually. Um... I think you could, how should I put this? I think you could influence the referees a little bit more lower down the leagues. Um, I think the refereeing was potentially better in the Premier League. Um, and that's like that, that, that's that's normal. You're going to have better players in the Premier League than you would in League One or League Two or the Championship. Uh, that's not saying the referees are lower down were not good referees because they were. Um, I would also say on an average the referees in the Premier League are a little bit more arrogant, um, but that may be to do they need to be because of the players they're playing with and the egos they play it, they're, they're dealing with. So they need to be a little bit more stubborn and a little bit more confident, if that makes sense. That's not all the referees. Um, but I would say the standard was a bit better in the, in the Premier League, just in terms of the fitness of the referees were, was a little bit better so they can get themselves in better positions. They can get around the pitch a little bit better. Um, you know them as well a little bit more because they're almost a public figure, I suppose, and you interact a bit more. Like I mentioned, they come into the training grounds. There's a bit of a relationship there already. Um, but the, the refereeing down the lower levels were was was exceptional as well. I mean, like anything, you're going to get good footballers, bad footballers. You're going to get good referees, bad referees. So I always enjoyed the referees. The best referees that I thought were the ones that you could talk to. And you might not always agree with the decisions, and, and that's no problem, but you could actually understand why he made that decision or you could have a conversation, especially as a captain. As a captain, you know, I was allowed to speak to the referee and there was a, a certain rule, I don't know if the rule exists anymore, where you're not allowed to be around the referee and it was just the captain. And if you can have a conversation with the referee, that allows me then to speak to my players and maybe calm the situation down and just say, look, he's given it for this reason. This is what he saw. This is why he's given a foul. Um, so they're the best, best referees, in my opinion, 
the ones that were arrogant and you couldn't speak to and just ushered you away and dismissed you, that just caused problems. It really did, in my opinion. Um, mm. So, yeah, the, re the referee during my career, most of it, I'd say 85% of the standard was really, really good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I guess you, you said it, right? There's going to be referees who are good and some who are not, and same with players. I exactly. Um, we're to, so before games, at least at lower levels, I'm pretty sure it happens at the elite level too, is the captain would meet with the referee before the game and they'll have a chat. Like, was that just really boring for you? Or like, did it, you know, was it just part of the, you know, the process that had to be done on the day? Or was it actually valuable to build a rapport with the rela uh, a relationship with the referee? I, I'm really intrigued by that. The, the, the latter of what you said, it was important to build that um, re relationship with the referee, the, the, to kind of, you know, we was always, I'll give you an example. When I was at Southampton and captain in Nigel, um, uh, Adkins was always very much would inform you of the referee's first name. So you would go and you wouldn't just call him ref. You'd go and speak to the referee. You didn't just sit and speak to him with his first name to build that relationship, shake his hand, look him in the eye, kind of build a bit of familiarity, a bit of a, of a friendness. Not that you're necessarily going to get an advantage, yeah. but it gives you a better possibility of maybe getting an advantage because football is, is a competitive nature. You want to get the decisions for yourself. If I'm a nice captain and he's dealing with someone who's an arsehole, yeah. then I'm more likely he's going to speak to me or more, more likely to give me the benefit of the doubt. So, no, I think it was valuable. You go in, you would meet the referees, you would meet the linesmen, you would meet the false official. There would be an official from the FA or um, Premier League or whoever was there as well. Um, and Nigel Atkins, again, he would always come. Usually it's the assistant manager that would, would do it with the captain. Mm -hmm. Nigel was always very much, I want to do it as well. So it was, it was mainly him that would come and do that as well, um, which was really important because he wanted that relationship with the referee in case he wanted to speak to him at half time after the game. So it was more about being a good person than when I first started playing football, you'd hear horror stories about trying to scare the referee, trying to intimidate the referee so they give you decisions. I don't think that works. and I don't think that's right to do that. Um, so it was an important part and it was part of the process as a team to, to try and build that relationship and always know the referee's first name. So you're not just calling him ref on the pitch or beforehand. You might be calling him Mike, Dave, Paul, whatever. And they respond better to that. Yeah. Um, and I think that really helps. So that you said being a good person, but you, you, it is tactical as well, right? It's trying to slightly get an advantage there. Yeah, that's fair enough. I, I think that's it's the same with us as as referees. We go out and you normally or m many referees would write the name of the captain now so they could speak on first name basis. But you, you'd get some referees who go out and just say number seven, number five, and, and in some cases you just haven't got a clue who the the players are. But the captain's the one that we always try and write down. So building rapport there. Um, Interesting. I, I didn't think you'd say that. I thought you'd be like, no, it was completely boring. We didn't need no. to. I'm really intrigued by that. Um, and then you, you mentioned and you said during a game, you were the one who obviously had to have the conversation with the referee during the game uh, as it goes on. We were taught that as well as referees that, you know, if a player is very close to a yellow card, if, if that challenge wasn't a yellow card, but it's close, Use the captain to try and bring that player, you know, bring them down, etc. Again, does that work? Like, did it work for you as a captain? Or are there some players that you just couldn't, like, you? I'd call you over and say, hey, can you sort number nine out? And you'd be like, well, I've, <laughs> there's no chance in hell that I'd be able to calm him down. So no point. Or, or did it work? Did it help? Did it give you that last kind of tool for you on the pitch? Yeah, because again, it's tactical. You always want that advantage. You always want that opportunity to potentially be able to keep someone on the pitch or, or gain that advantage. You know, that's part of sport. It's not cheating. It's part of sport. And I think it was more the other way around that if I had a relationship with the referee, I would just say, I don't know the referees, I'd just say ref, I know, I know, I'll speak to him. So I'm almost getting in there before the referee, before he thinks, oh, it's another yellow card, it's a red card. You've seen it's a late challenge, you know he's booked. You go, look, 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 last challenge, I get it, I get it. I'll speak to him, no problem. If he does it again, he's off, I'll let him know. So it's having that relationship. And also the referee would come to you as well and go, look, Dean, he's on his last warning here. If he does it again, he's off. And then that might mean me, you know, just having a word with him or having a word with the manager and say, look, 
gaffer. The, man, the ref, the ref, looking for him. He's going to send him off one more tackle, and he's gone. So you want to keep eleven men on the pitch. So having that, it's that communication line with the referee. If you can have that, it's really, really important. It not only helps the player, but it helps the referee as well, mm-hmm. because the referees. They want to enjoy the game as well. You, you see some referees are smiling while they're refing, and great. So they should. They should enjoy their careers. And if the players are smiling as well, um, I always used to make it a massive thing afterwards as well. I don't. I don't know why I did it, but I just felt I built that relationship after the game. I would always make the effort to go and speak to the referees, shake their hands, but properly do it. Not just dismiss them, win, lose, or draw. Go and speak to them because we're going to have them three or four times that season. So mm-hmm. it's all about. It is building that relationship. Look, I'm not going to lie. There's times that they frustrate the hell out of me as a player, which yeah. is fine. And I'm sure the players frustrate the hell out of referees as well. But if you can have that little bit of understanding, uh, it's massive. But yeah, it would it would help if a referee came to me and said, look, he's on his last warning. Or if I could jump in quickly before the referee is going to make a decision and I quickly catch him and go, look, look, I know I'll speak to him. No problem. Uh, he's got uh, He's on his last warning. It definitely would help. Mm, cool. So that's that's actually a great insight. Obviously, as a referee, we do appreciate like players coming up at the end and making the effort and not being sort of like sarcastic and being like, actually, you've had a game because it is quite tough. Um, but is there anything like we as a referee can do to help build that relationship with you? Obviously, you've spoken quite heavily about you're trying to build it with us, but we find it quite important to try and build it with players, really. And we try, like, especially me, I find it quite difficult sometimes especially with the captain, because I know that you've got a lot of like, on your plate as well. So is there anything we can do to like help that relationship with, with you guys? Uh, it's just, I would always say just talking and just being open to that conversation um, and be a little bit, I suppose, understanding as well, because, you know, the level I was playing at, there's so much on the line. You know, personally, I'm trying to keep my place in the team. I'm trying to win the game. I'm trying to gain every advantage I can. I'm trying to uh, impress the manager, keep the fans on the side. There's so much pressure on a player that at times he's going to lose his temper. At times he's going to say things that he doesn't really mean. Um, so as a referee, I always felt it good when a referee would kind of step back a little bit and maybe think, OK, well, that's not normally what things like. I'll let that one go. If I did it again, of course, yellow card, sending off. Uh, I completely understand that. But it is just having that communication. I think I was always very much... I would always try to treat a referee with respect and hopefully he would treat me with respect back. Now that would go out the window if the referee was really arrogant, wouldn't speak to me, then I'd probably go the other way as well and could be a little bit nasty as well because I'm thinking, uh, I'm not enjoying this game, you're not as well. So if you're going to give me some stick, I'll give you some back. So, you know, some referees as well, some referees had really harsh banter as well would absolutely kill you but that was part of the game I didn't mind that it was entertaining so I think it's just been able to speak to each other I think that makes a huge difference it really does because as players we're going to get things wrong and referees are going to get things wrong but you're also going to get a lot right I used to do that a lot if a referee got a decision right I'd praise him a lot and mm-hmm. say look great decision you know, if you'd given us a penalty and it really was a penalty, you'd praise the, you'd praise the decision. Even yeah. if, you know, like it's an advantage to yourself, you still want to make them feel good. And it, it just builds that relationship. So just that open communication is everything, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. No, you, really. spoke, you spoke about referees making mistakes. And obviously, like, we're not perfect. We know when we've made a mistake. Like, sometimes we've been told to, like, admit that we've made a mistake. Obviously, not always on the big ones. Like, oh... I shouldn't have given a penalty. I should have given a penalty, but maybe like a quick free kick on the edge of the box or in the middle of the park. And you thought, yeah, actually, maybe I did get that wrong. But what's your opinion on like referees admitting their mistakes, really? I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. Do they need to admit their, admit their mistakes? Maybe not. I don't think there's that, that much time to think about it in a game. There's so much going on and you're, you're involved in a game to so then suddenly think, I need to let them know I've made a mistake. Maybe not. I think I was always very much one. I think a referee would know when he's made a mistake. Uh, you would know when they've made a mistake as well. So I'd probably play on that a little bit and go, right, you owe us one now. Yeah. And, you know, that was very, very common before VAR. A referee would always look to even it up. So when, let's say, they've made a mistake and you would be kind of in their ear a little bit going, look, you still owe us one. You still owe us one. If there's a penalty decision that's 50-50, you know, it is or isn't, it's more like he's going to give you it. 
so it's it's just being a little bit cute about things as well without taking advantage um but you'd appreciate that the referee's gonna make mistakes look as a player i made hundreds of mistakes i give the ball away and someone would score a goal it's just you get on with it the referee doesn't then come up to me and give me abuse so it, it, you've got to kind of keep it on the same wavelength so it wasn't a matter of i don't think referees need to admit they've made a mistake within the game maybe afterwards maybe you could do that when the game's finished but i think the players would know and the referee would know so you can kind of play on that a little bit i used to try and use that to my advantage instead of giving them uh some abuse maybe uh, or some harsh words i'd probably think okay well i've got a way in now maybe yeah the um you mentioned around like the relationships are important were there and i'm not asking you to name names but were there players in your squad that just hated referees and just had no respect for referees that made it really hard or because I don't know, maybe at the elite level is different, but at the lower levels, there are players that we found or that I've definitely refereed that I just know have no interest in speaking to me even before the game started, right? So were there ever players like that? And then how, as the captain, how did you try and manage them? Because you knew that was a probably a ticking time bomb potentially, I don't know. So did you ever have players like that? And if so, how did you manage them? I would say, no, I don't think I ever played with a player that hated a referee. So I don't think it was ever that strong. Yeah. Uh, players that would dismiss referees, um, mm. would be uh, overly aggressive with referees. Um, but again, that would be tactical. It would be, isn't it, hardly anything personal. There's no yeah. personal about It's more tactical thinking their best approach is to be aggressive every to bullying him yeah. and get into the decision. So playing out with a bit of, of fear. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I'm not going to go to the player. I'll go to the referee and say, look, just leave him. He's fine. Look, you know, he doesn't mean it. He's just been overly aggressive. And maybe then just, I don't know, look at the player as well. Maybe just say, look, leave it for a minute sort of thing. Yeah. You're, on the ed you're on the edge here. So, again, it was more myself with the referee, knowing that someone, you know, if a player's coming running up, steaming up to the referee, I might just stand in front of them. Just like quickly, no, no I've got this. So... No, I, I think that's the best way of dealing with it. I've never known a player to hate a referee, personally. Uh, dislike uh, the way... That's good to know. So, dislike who, the should, way they referee, maybe, but not hate them. Yeah. Sure. Um, two, two questions, kind of one coming back to VAR, and they're very linked. So do you think players, like... When they're, especially at the elite level, not we've not seen an elite player ever turn and become a referee. I, I, I'm intrigued to know why, like, is it just purely financial? Like, obviously, referees don't get paid anywhere near a player. But, like, is there any attraction for a, a player to become a referee? Like, would you have ever considered it when you finished? It's a good question. I think I'm open-minded. Would I have considered it? Maybe would I have been the first person to do it? Maybe not. I think that's the issue. I think okay. you've got to be. If you had two or three players do it, I think suddenly then it may open up a new market. You you talk about the financials there, but the financials are, as a as a top referee when it's a full time professional career now mm -hmm. is good money in the real world. Football money is not the real world. You know, yeah. football money is made up money. It doesn't you know at the, at the elite level now. You know, players that are on. 100, 200, 300,000 pounds a yep. week, you know, that's the small percentage in the world get, get paid that. So, but the referees at the top level will be being paid really good money. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a career that's, it'd be quite sensible for a player to go into, to be honest. Um, but again, like I say, would I have been the first player to do it? I think it's, you know, I think it would work brilliantly for, for the FA. I think it would work brilliantly for the, the game. I think the players would, I don't think you would be initially like, as in, you, right, I really like him because he was an ex-player, but you'd have the respect. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe maybe players might find it a little bit hard because I don't think all players agree with the rules, if that makes sense. Maybe yeah. all referees don't agree with the rules, but they have to abide by the rules, if That's that makes right. sense as well. That's so the players may be a little bit more lenient and going, well, I understand why you did that, so I'm not going to give a, a free kick sort of thing. So... I would like to see it. I really would. I would like to see it with the VARs, definitely. I mean, you could start with that. The, the players could be in the, I don't know where they do it, whatever park it's called. Park, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that could be. <laughs> My next question was, yeah. yeah, that's the. 
you could do that alongside a referee. So you could almost have a, you'd have to have a time limit. You know, again, you can have a long debate because you'd have an argument for 20 minutes and all the crowd will win. But you could have a period of a minute where you go, like, I can see why that is offside. That's not offside. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see why that's a foul, not a foul. He's tripped there. He's not meant to do it. Because I think as an ex-player, you've been through those experiences. So you know when someone's looking to really hurt someone in a tackle. Yeah. You know when it's just late. You know when it's just mistimed. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's where you could start and it could develop from there. But I'd love to see a player come out and be a referee. And look, I think there's, it'd be a good advantage because I think they would get fast-tracked as well, which, which would help. But would you, so the, the, the difference with refereeing, at least uh, in the current scheme, is you have to start from the bottom and work your way up. It's, there's no real academy and fast track, but there could be, definitely. So my question is, like, where, where would it become, a, let's say you're a Premier League player, you've just retired, and you fancy giving it a crack? You don't really want to be turning out on a Sunday league game. So, like, wh wh at what level does it become, like, okay, well, National League, you're going to go, we're, we're going to put you in National League now. You know what? Does it, I think, does it what, yeah. yeah. I think what would happen, in my personal opinion, this is my opinion, I don't know if it's happening no, no. better than me. I think they would put them in academies. So you'd start lower down. So in terms of starting lower down at the terms of the level of football, mm -hmm. but it would be a safe environment, if that yeah. makes sense. You wouldn't yeah. be put out on a Sunday on a park pitch. Yeah. The blokes who've got hangovers and all that to go, right, you've got to earn your stripes. I don't think that would happen because you would yeah. be identified and fast track because it happens in coaching. So I, I started my coaching badges and players that are good coaches get identified and you get fast tracked. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean you miss the qualifications out. It means you get more attention and they identify and you go, right, we need to get you through these badges because you're going to become a really good coach. Yeah. So I think you could do that with the referee where you go, well, actually... It looks like you've got the mentality. It looks like you've got the attitude to, to build a career in this. You've got to earn your stripes. You've got to go through the qualification. You've got to do the experience, but we will put you in certain situations. We will put you at, you know, we're gonna, you're going to be refereeing Man United v Man City under 12s at a lovely training ground in a safe environment where no parents are going to, you know, there's going to be no abuse. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I think yeah. that's where you get the advantage. Yeah. Um, with, with with players, that's just my opinion. And no, I think if sorry, I think if that was made aware, I think if that was come out and the referees or the FA would explain that, I think then you could get some former players go. Well, actually, I quite fancy doing this. Really interesting. Very interesting. Um, cool. I think the only the only other kind of question that I had written down was it. You can name name if you want, but like, who was your favourite? Was there ever a favourite referee you had, and why were they a favourite? And the reason I'm asking that is, we, we we always try and ask what is a good referee in your opinion. And you, you mentioned that one that talks, right? But is there anything in the your favourite referee that kind of everyone else can look at? So, who did you have a favourite referee, or was was it just like? A couple of honestly, honestly, I'd say I didn't have a favorite referee. Secondly, I'd probably say I can't remember all their names to start with, so that that's probably why I can't name names. But it would be the one I look, I'm not saying I like referees that were soft touches, that's not what I'm trying to say, but that I could influence them. I like referees that would just talk to you and explain the decision. I almost like referees that were very uh, firm as well to go, Look, it's a penalty, Dean, there's no arguing about it, this is why it's a penalty move away, right, done, I'm out, I'm out of your way then. So very clear, no confusion, but explained why it was a penalty. It was a penalty, he came through the back of him, he hit his leg first, then connected the ball, it's a penalty, get your players out of the way, fine, okay, no problem, no confusion. Um, so it's just that open dialogue, it, it's huge. Honestly, I can't express how big it is as a player because then I'm almost on the referee's side with the other player because I'd be like you're not going lads we're not going to get anything out of this just leave it or look yeah. it's, it's okay he's explained the decision let's be honest it's a penalty he's going to book you so an honest open firm referee were the best ones always brilliant cool Dean thank you so much for your time I think that is definitely one of my favourite chats we've had uh, John I think it probably is yours as well but like um, super intrigued. I'm sure there'll be some questions from our audience. If there are, I'll I'll, uh, I'll send them.
send me away and you can maybe yeah. we'll, we'll shout them out in a, another one so dean thank you very much and um we appreciate your time cheers guys thanks very much great insight there from dean hammond uh, about how to build rapport with players both problem players and captains as well so hopefully you can take those little snippets of information and bring them into your games as well obviously with the return of football it's a great time to get practicing before the new season starts again in august um thanks for the support once again we had a great podcast last week we've had a great podcast this week um if you're new here please subscribe uh, if it's on podcasts or youtube and if you could drop us a like or a five-star review that'd be great but until then enjoy the week and we'll see you next week <laughs>